This is a video that concerns the hand calculation of an independent samples t-test. The example that we'll be using is taken from the book Statistics for Psychology, 3rd edition by Aaron and Aaron, which published in 2003. The example that we'll be using comes from page 368 of that book. This specific example looks at whether or not seven subjects in an experimental group differ significantly from seven subjects in a control group on a score that concerns um, employees' ratings of effectiveness. The null hypothesis is that subjects in the control group and subjects in the experimental group come from populations where the population means for employers' ratings on these variables, on this variable, are the same. That is, the null hypothesis is there is no difference in the means in the populations for the experimental or the control group. When we conduct this analysis, the very first thing that we do for both the experimental group subjects and the control group subjects is we calculate the mean. So we sum the scores, come up with a total score of 42. We divide that by the seven scores and for the experimental group we get a mean of six. For the control group we sum up the seven scores we get a mean of 21. We divide that 21 by seven and we get a mean of three. The next thing that we do is we subtract the group means from each score in order to get the deviation score. So six minus six is 0, 4 minus 6 is negative 2, 9 minus 6 is 3, and so on. For the control group, where the mean was 3, 6 minus 3 is 3, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, 5 minus 3 is 2, and so on. We sum up these deviations to get a, a total deviation score or an, an average deviation score of 0. The reason that that occurs is because these are deviations around the mean. The negative values balance the positive values. So we're trying to get a sense of how far on the average scores spread up in the mean. We obviously cannot just use the deviations because of the negative values. So to get rid of the negatives, we square these deviations. So 0 squared is 0, negative 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 1 squared is 1. We do the same thing for the control group. 3 squared is 9, negative 2 squared is 4, 2 squared is 4, and so on. For both the experimental group and for the control group, we are going to sum up these square deviations. These sums of square deviations are often referred to in statistics books as sums of squares, SS. The sums of squares actually stands for the sums of the squared deviations around the mean. So in this case, the sums of the squared deviations for the experimental group are 24, and for the control group, 26. To get a sense of the variance around this, we would typically, to describe the sample variance, we would typically just divide this 24 by the number of scores. So it would be 24 divided by 7, and we would divide the 26 by 7. But since we are making inference, we are needing to divide the 24 by the degrees of freedom rather than by the actual n. We need to do that because Sample variances tend to systematically underestimate population variances, so we need to adjust our denominator slightly to compensate for that underestimation. So we're going to divide 24 by 6 instead of by 7, and we're going to divide 26 by 6 instead of 7. So 24 divided by 6 gives us an estimate of the population variance for the experimental group of 4, and 26 divided by 6, this 26 divided by 6, gives us a population variance estimate for the control groups of 4.33. We're going to use 
these population variance estimates in order to generate the pooled population variance estimate. One of the things that happens with independent samples t-tests is that we want to be able to pool the variances of the two groups so we can conduct the test. The assumption of homogeneity of variance is required in order for us to, to merge or add or pool these sums of squares using traditional approaches. So we're going to proceed with the assumption that the um, homogeneity of variance expectation has been met. We're going to be pooling these um, population variance estimates. The way we do that is we're going to end up doing a weighted sum. So the first population variance estimate, that is the one for the experimental group, is going to be weighted by the proportion of degrees of freedom that come from the experimental group. So we know that we have six degrees of freedom in the experimental group, six degrees of freedom in the control group, giving us a total of 12 degrees of freedom. So the six degrees of freedom that we have in the experimental group divided by the 12 degrees of freedom that we have in the total multiplied by the population variance estimate for the experimental group is 6 divided by 12 times 4. We add that to the weighted population variance estimate for the control group. Again, in this case, since we have the same number of subjects in both the experimental group and the control group, the weighting looks the same. Six degrees of freedom for the control group, 12 degrees of freedom total. So that and we multiply that ratio times the control group um, population variance estimate. So in this case, we have half of our degrees of freedom being multiplied by the population variance estimate for the experimental group and half of the degree of freedom weighting being multiplied by the control group population variance estimate. That gives us 0.5 times 4 is 2, 0.5 times 4.33 is approximately 2.17. I add up these two weighted population variance estimates and I get our pooled population variance estimate. This formula here works equally well whether we have equal or unequal sizes of our two groups. While theoretically we tend to strive to have equal numbers of subjects in both conditions, often it doesn't happen. So this formula um, handles unequal um, sample sizes in two groups. We use this pooled population variance estimate when we are starting to look at understanding the sampling distribution. So what we do is we divide that pooled population variance estimate by the number of subjects in the experimental group and we divide it by the number of subjects in the control group. So it's 4.17 divided by 7 for both of these groups. We then pool these two variance estimates for the sampling distribution just like we pooled things here but in this case we're pooling them for the sampling distribution instead of the population variance. So we have 0.6 plus 0.6 gives us a combined estimate of the variance of the sampling distribution or a pooled estimate of the sampling variance um, for the sampling distribution of 1.2. This is in squared units. Right? These squared deviations from the mean are in squared units. The variance estimates that we have here are all in squared units. The variance of our sampling distribution is in squared units. So we need to be able to get our, our estimate of
the standard deviation of the estimate of the spread of the sampling distribution back to the same units. So we move from variance to standard deviation simply by taking the square root of the variance of the sampling distribution. So the square root of 1.2 is 1.1. That's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, better known as the standard error of the difference or the standard error of the sampling distribution of the independent t-test. So we are using our observed difference between the groups means Okay, so one group mean was 6, the other group mean was 3. That difference, 6 minus 3, or 3, is going to be our numerator. Our denominator is going to be the standard error of our sampling distribution. Every time we calculate a t-test, the numerator is going to be differences in the statistics, in this case, the differences in the means, and the denominator is going to be the standard error of that difference. So we divide the 3, that is the difference in the means of the two groups, by the standard error. The standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So in this case that standard error is 1.1. That 1.1 tells us that when the null hypothesis is true, we will have about one and a tenth score difference moving out above and below the mean that will encompass 68 percent of the area of the distribution. So 68 percent of the individuals in the population will have a score that is either negative 1.1 or positive 1.1 or anywhere in the different anywhere in that area. So when we look at calculating this, we're going to divide our observed difference by that standard error, which is our standard deviation of our sampling distribution, and we get a t-calculated value of 2.73. That 2.73 tells us that our observed difference of 3 was 2.7 times larger than the difference that we were expecting just due to random sampling fluctuation, or it is 2.73 times greater than the standard error. Okay, so this is a ratio, right? This number is 2.73 times greater than the denominator. This also tells us that the observed difference falls 2.73 units away from the mean, to the right of the mean. The mean difference in this sampling distribution will be zero because we are drawing the sampling distribution from, from a population in which the null hypothesis is true. So our question is whether or not this observed t-value of 2.73 is statistically significant. To determine that, we look at our t-critical value. Our t-critical value is going to be based on degrees of freedom that are the sums of the two degrees of freedom for our group. So we have total degrees of freedom of 12. We're going to use an alpha level of 0.05. And we're going to conduct a two-tailed test because we're just trying to see if there is any difference between the experimental and the control group. When we look at a t-table with 12 degrees of freedom, an alpha of 0.05, and a two-tailed test, the t-critical value is going to be plus or minus 2.179. Therefore, we would reject the null hypothesis if our t-calculated value was less than negative 2.179 or greater than positive 2.179. As our t-calculated score is 2.73, it is larger than the positive 2.179 which allows us to reject the null hypothesis. Again, the null hypothesis is that the population uh, mean difference is zero. We reject that null hypothesis, which leads us to believe that there is a statistically significant difference between subjects in the experimental group and subjects in the control group.